Here at the Threads Podcast, we value mental health, and we like to peer pressure our listeners into getting help. And what's so exciting about that is we now have a sponsor who believes in our show and has offered to sponsor us. I got to give a quick shout out to BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with them in less than 24 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There happens to be a broad range of expertise among BetterHelp's counselor network, and you may not even have access to something like that in your local market. The service is available for clients worldwide. And you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in those uncomfortable waiting rooms as you do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily at betterhelp.com slash reviews. That's betterhelp.com slash reviews. Yeah, so all you got to do is go to betterhelp.com slash threads. That's betterhelp.com slash threads. And you can join the over 700,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. For Threads listeners, we have a special offer. You can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash threads. That's betterhelp.com slash threads. So go check it out. Get your 10% off. Get started in therapy. You can do it. Hey there, it's Ben and Jason, and we are with a special guest today on Threads Podcast, Life Unfiltered. Today, we have Eric Allen from the top-rated MMA podcast and Bearded Biz. Eric joins us from the great state of Idaho. Eric, thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, guys. How are you? Thank you so much, man, for the opportunity. This is uh, I'm really excited to be on here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, obviously, you have the, a pretty big MMA podcast and looks like Bearded Biz, too, which talks to... Uh, is it bearded entrepreneurs or just you're bearded? So uh, beards not required, but uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> I've been asked that a few times, like, oh, I don't have a beard, I can't come on the show. Um, but uh, yeah, so blessed enough to have the number one MMA podcast in the Northwest in top rated MMA. Uh, started it in 2017. Did my first almost 100 shows out of a walk in closet because I didn't have space in my house. <laughs> Awesome. And um, then launched the Bearded Biz Show in January of 2019. And, and combined, I've done close to 200 episodes now between the two shows uh, and really just been blessed with amazing guests from Ken Shamrock to Ed Milet to Sean Whalen to, um, you know, a 14 year old kid out in England making 30 grand a year from a farm, what? you know, and it's just uh, really, really cool to, to the people I get to talk to. Cool. Yeah, that's incredible. So, um how often are you recording for these podcasts? Uh, I record shows probably three times a week, two to three times a week. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And then I release shows every Friday is Bearded Biz Show release day. And every Saturday is top rated MMA release day. So uh, okay. I, re I release shows weekly. My goal is to release 50 shows from each of those this year in 2020. So, uh, yeah, it should, it's going to be a busy, busy year for sure. Yeah, no kidding. That's Man. a huge goal. So Seriously. why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started, uh, if you uh, fought in MMA or or just a super fan and, and kind of go into your background a little bit. Yeah, super fan for sure. Never fought. I mean, trained a little bit of karate, maybe boxing as a kid, and and but never really competed or anything like that. But, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in eastern Washington and would go visit my cousin in this small town called Prosser, Washington. And we would be in like first and second grade and I would never let my kids do this because they're about that age now. But we would walk like a mile into town and we'd go to like the VHS rental store and we'd go rent UFC one and two and, you know, and go home and just watch these guys beat the snot out of each other. So at a very early age, you know, I was watching UFC. My dad always 
was like, hey, you you know, watch ninja movies or martial arts or Bruce Lee and stuff like that. And I think I was a ninja for Halloween for like 10 years straight. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Dude, did you watch the last fight with Conor McGregor and Cowboy? I did. Yeah, I'm a huge, huge Cowboy fan. Um, he's always been one of my favorite fighters. I've never been a fan of Conor McGregor. I just thought his, his antics are just a little over the top for me. And, and um, I think I've just kind of seen through the – he's not as good of a fighter as most people think. And um, But he definitely impressed me in this uh, fight and, and showed that he, he had some heart and, and – you know, was humble in the wind for sure. Yeah, that was good to see him uh, hug Cowboy's grandma, and they had oh. like a long, long exchange. I mean, for yeah. for you, you would think it'd be like ten seconds, but I swear he, they were chatting for like thirty, forty five seconds. So right, yeah, that was yeah. really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're uh, that's I love Cowboy's grandma and the whole story of the ranch and all that. It's really, really cool. Yeah, it was. I I love Cowboy too. I do like Connor. Um, I yep. just like how he calls his shots and it, it happens. Um, yep. but, but I yep. do like Cowboy. He's a he's a grinder, man. Like yep. he just he'll fight every weekend if if they would let him. Right. Yeah. <laughs> think, think he's out for a hot second though for a while. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, man. I ouch, hope so. Out. Yeah. So tell us about um, you know, you growing up. Threads is kind of about uh, life unfiltered. So yep. you know, I I grew up in an abusive home. You know, um, I've had some trauma issues. And so uh, why don't we touch on a little bit about that? I know uh, in your bio, you, you uh, to us, you talked about um, some things that went on when you were younger. Yeah, you know, I grew up in what I thought was kind of a typical household. You know, my, my parents were married. We'd go to Sunday school and my dad was always adventurous. So we'd go out. We lived kind of in this deserty area. So we'd go find treasures that, that were, you know, dumped by people out in the desert. Or my dad would take my buddy and I, who were still friends, so here – 35 years later, he still reminds me, remember that time your dad threw us in a dumpster behind that store to go find treasure? And so we would always do that stuff. And um, through that whole time, I never realized my dad was actually an alcoholic, very mm-hmm. quiet, um, never abusive. Uh, but uh, my parents got divorced when I was 11 years old. And then both of them got together with somebody fairly quickly. Unfortunately, my mom went right back to a gentleman who was also an alcoholic, but extremely abusive. So from about 11 the 13 years old, I watched my mom get beat up quite a bit. Um, oh, man. And um, when I was 20, I was 12. I think it was about midway through my eighth grade year. My mom and this boyfriend decided to move us to Montana. So we lived up in Stevensville, Montana, and they had a child together. So I'm 13 mm. years older than my stepbrother. But yeah. uh, so when we moved to Montana, and I have a sister as well. They rented this house that was three bedrooms. So it was their bedroom, my little brother, the baby, uh, his room, and my sister. And so they said, well, where are we going to put Eric? They basically put up this plastic wall in the garage that had a fireplace on one side. And that was my room through the winters for two years. In Montana. In Montana. It was freezing. So I would stoke the fires you know, at night and then put on like 10 layers of clothes and try to stay warm. And as soon as the fire went out, of course, it would just be freezing. But um, so watch a lot of that abuse happen. And then when I was 13 years old, I was home, brushed my teeth. I think my brother was asleep. My sister was staying at a friend's house, you know, and I, they came home arguing nothing really out of the normal, but I was, as I was brushing my teeth, it was like midnight. And I remember something in my heart, just like, man, you got to turn around, you got to look. And so the way the house was laid out was if I'm in the bathroom and I, walk out the hallway and I turn to the right, I would get to the dining room, to the kitchen, to the pantry, and then to the garage door where my room was at. And so as I look around the corner and I look down there, right in front of the garage door, my mom's boyfriend is on top of her, just like punching her, like ground and pound oh, over and over. Oh man. And I'm thinking, how in the hell can I get this guy off my mom? Right. And the only thing that came to my mind was to grab like a frying pan. <laughs> You know, and so <laughs> awesome. I uh, I snuck up behind them as he's doing this, just unloading, and I grabbed one of those cast iron pans that you would take with you camping, the real heavy duty ones. Yeah. And having played baseball for ten years, I've got a pretty good swing, and I just walked up and I swung as hard as I could, and I smacked him in the back of the head and watched his head split. And as he oh. turned around, it did knock him out because he was so drunk. But as he turned around, he said, "What the." And then mid sentence, I took another swing and hit him in the forehead and split that face open again. And at that point, it it was, it wobbled him pretty good. But again, he didn't knock him out. 
I fell over on that second time. And I remember him like standing over me yelling. And as he started to do that, my mom comes out of nowhere and throws like six punches in a row to his face and blood is splatting on the her. wall behind him, you know, just crazy. And, and my mom, the thing was, he never pressed charges ever. Really? <laughs> Not one time. Oh, and, man. How, uh, and this happened many times. It sounds like many times all the time. Yeah, all the time. And uh, so after that, I left to go back to Washington to live with my dad uh, okay. for my freshman year or excuse me, my sophomore year of high school. So I had seen guys that I grew up with for you know a few years, had to kind of make new friends going to this high school I hadn't been to before. And my dad rented this house that was his it was owned by his girlfriend's mom. And so basically, OK, what he did was he rented this house and then he would put 20 bucks in the cup. And that was my lunch money for the week. And then he would fill the fridge with like hungry man meals and put cereal and stuff in there. And then he would go stay with his girlfriend. So I literally, for my sophomore year, all through the rest of high school, I saw my dad about once every other month because he would, that's when he would come home. I basically just raised myself and in this house, it ended up being the party house. So I got into drugs, um, you know, of course started smoking pot and then it was like, Oh, what's LSD. Oh, I want to take that. Oh, I want to get those mushrooms. Oh, that's, uh, you know, opium. Great. That's a, oh, that's hash. Boom. You know, and it even got to the point where I wanted to take so much drugs or, or you know, get uh, just take a trip or hallucinate on something that I didn't want to pay five bucks for the hit acid. I could go to the store and pay two fifty for a bottle of Robitussin DM and chug that bottle and have wow. the same hallucination. Right. I mean, crazy. And uh, barely graduated high school, got into college, tried that for, you know, half a year. And then a friend of mine said, hey, if you want to move to Seattle? And I was like, heck yeah. So I had a hundred bucks in my pocket and I moved up to Seattle and I moved between the ages of 18 and 21. I moved 21 times. Oh, man. Holy cow. It was uh, crazy, man. Living on couches of people I didn't know. They're like, oh, yeah, I got this second cousin who has this sunroom in this house that you can live with, you know, for a week. Well, he's got eight other people living in that house and <laughs> wow. literally like didn't have a fridge. I put peanut butter and jelly outside on the roof because I had this window and that was my breakfast, lunch and dinner while I lived there because I didn't have a room or I mean, they didn't have fridge or anything like that. So it was pretty crazy, man. Well, you've come you've come a long way then. Holy smokes. Yeah, it was. I mean, I got arrested at 18 years old before I moved to Seattle for having a bong. And so I have that fun mug shot, to, you know, and so it's <laughs> right. Uh, it's, so did you have a beard at age 18? I had sideburns it really ah, early on. So that was kind of okay. known for having the sideburns. Nice. Um, I grew up an Elvis fan. My, my grandma is the <laughs> rock in my family and she's like four foot two. And my grandpa was like six foot three. And, wow. um, you know, and so and my grandma who was born in the thirties. I think she'll be 83 or 84 this year. She was born a pound and a half literally in mm. like, and survived. They used to put her in the oven to keep her warm as a what? baby. Oh yeah. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> crazy I guess whatever story, works. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, and then, man. you know, birth six kids. So I come from a pretty large family. And so, man, it's, it's been a journey for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned the abuse and, um, Man, I that's just insane the story about the frying pan and everything else. Um what differences do you see between the family you grew up with, the craziness and your family now um with your wife and kids? What are the biggest differences that you see there? Oh man, there my wife and I really just try to focus on this loving on our kids and we let our kids see that we love each other. So it's funny. Cause I, you know, I always, I love my wife, giving a kiss, give her a kiss, give her hugs all the time. And my kids are like trying to pry us apart, you know, Hey, don't do that. You know, right? <laughs> you know, it's a, um, but they also see us argue sometimes it's just life, but we also hmm. very much, um, tell our kids like, you never have to worry about us getting a divorce. It's not something that's even come to our mind. My wife and I have had very deep conversations about that. Like she comes from a crazy background as well. Her family's, kind of on the nutty side, you know, just like my, my family's kind of on the nutty side. Right. So it kind of depends, sure. you know, the, everybody has issues, but we both come from this crazy broken homes. And so we really said that, you know, if we're going to do this, if we're going to get married, then let's make sure that we're going to stay married and let's make sure that we raise our kids in an environment that neither of us raised, were raised in. Um, yeah, you know, my wife absolutely. and I, we met at Starbucks. She does not drink coffee. I worked at Starbucks at <laughs> night. Um, and she does not drink coffee, but she was at Starbucks. She was studying 
And oh, I was a okay. night manager. I was working in the music business. So I used to work for Universal Records. And oh, on, wow. on my nights off, I would go work at Starbucks. And uh, so that's where we met. And we actually met and married within one year. And then we'll be celebrating 15 years marriage this year. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So, yeah, it, you know, it's been fun, man. We're actually... I, we're born at exactly the same time, different days, different what? years, but 1.41 p.m. is the documented time <laughs> on our birth certificates. That's crazy. Meant to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you think that um, – I guess what I'm curious about is have you heard of the term trauma bond? I don't know if I've heard trauma bond. No. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Well, the basic idea behind that is you are essentially – attracted to other people who have been through difficult times. Oh. So would you say that you and your wife um, was the trauma and the family craziness, something that brought you together or did that not come out until later in the relationship? No, I think we early, we, we knew early on that we both had come from, you know, we had, I'm very open, like pretty much tr very transparent with a lot of things in my life and my background. And, um, so we knew early on, but and, and that makes total sense um, that we just both knew that we didn't want to raise our kids in that environment, you know? And yeah. For and sure. um, so, you know, and I haven't, you know, I grew up like, even when I was in the music business, I was a heavy drinker or things like that. And I haven't drank for probably uh, six years. Um, I don't have an issue with drinking, but you know, my wife doesn't drink. And so it's just an interesting, like we raise our kids and just know like, Hey, this is how, this is how we were raised. And we also, we haven't been fully transparent with them yet because they're still pretty young, you know, 10 and seven almost. And so sure. um, they're starting to get that age where they can kind of know, but if they get into high school and they start trying things, I know what that is like. So they're going to get caught. So, you know, we're, we're ready to, we're, we're pretty prepared for that stuff. So, <laughs> so in regards to the, the MMA podcast yeah. and the bearded biz is, is this is what you do for a living or you're not quite there yet? I'm not a full-time entrepreneur yet. I would love to. Okay. Um, I, I've always been an entrepreneur minded guy. Like when I was 10 years old, I had 15 yards that I mowed for two summers in a row. And I was making several hundred dollars a month at, at 10 years old and 11 years old. And that, that's good money. It, it was. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I love doing that. So I've always had this kind of entrepreneur mindset. I, I had a time where I was very much into this you know, shiny object syndrome, what's out there and let's do this. And I've wasted a lot of money on stupid things. And, um, so I, I, I haven't monetized my podcast yet. My business top rated me. It's, it's definitely a, a passion of mine to go full time. It's also a passion of mine to just start spreading love. You know, I didn't release my full story in video format until about three months ago. Uh, and so I've just kind of, uh, pursued MMA, pursued the podcast thing and really tried to make that happen. And monetization is pretty low right now. Uh, but right now I actually work for a software company during the okay. day. I'm, I'm very blessed to work from home. So I worked remote, uh, for uh, since 2015 and I've, I worked with a, a small startup, uh, to the pretty large companies. And so, yeah, that's what I do full time, but I get up at 4 a.m. I work in my businesses till about seven 30 ish. And then I flip over to the other work computer and I do that to about five and those are my days. Wow. So you talked about you filed bankruptcy at, at 21. I did. Uh, with, with some debt. So how uh, did that change the way you think about money? Or um, did you say, this is disgusting. I need to get my ass together. You know, it was interesting. I, I had no uh, clue about how to like do finances at all. I mean, I got my first Sears credit card at 18 years old. And I bought a camcorder because I thought it was cool to record crap of skateboarding and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Right? You know, and I think it cost me like two grand. And I was like thinking I was oh the coolest dude. Right. Oh. That was the first credit card that I had. And then I was like, oh, I could get these at every store. I don't have to pay this. Man, this is awesome. So I had. Yeah. I, when I was 21 years old, I was twenty eight thousand dollars in debt, including Ooh. a car, um, which the car was about twelve thousand of that. So the rest was all credit card debt. And um yeah, so I just I, I was to the point where before I filed bankruptcy, I would borrow money from Money Tree to pay my bills and then go to the other money borrowing place to pay back Money Tree. And I was in this rotation for about six months where I was just going back and forth every week, you know. And um when I filed bankruptcy at twenty one years old, it it humbled me quite a bit. You know, I was living in this very ghetto apartment in Renton, Washington, across from the uh 
cemetery from where Jimi Hendrix is buried. So that was the only cool part about it. But um, <laughs> other than that, I, I lived in just like the, the multicultural, like old school it used to be hotel now rented apartment type thing. And um, lots of craziness. My now wife, when she'd come over, she's like, what the heck? You are all scared to come in there and all that. Um, but yeah, finances for us now, I mean, my wife is very smart financially. You know, I couldn't even get it when we got married. I couldn't even open a savings account without her being a oh, co-signer. Yeah. Um, and so she is the the person that's helped us kind of get back on track. We've been able to um, pay down. You know, when we got married, I had a, a little bit of credit card debt. And we've been able to pay that off and, and um, 100 percent debt free at this point. And, and um, that's amazing. You know, it's it's been fun. I mean, like I said, it's taken us years to get to that point. But yeah, we're we we do kind of a Dave Ramsey envelope system, but we do it digitally. And so okay. the banks hate us because anytime I go to <laughs> like take money out or move money around, they're like, you have 32 bank accounts. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> but, you know, that's incredible. You know, and, so do you have a debit card for each envelope? Is that basically how it works? And so here's the cool thing. I actually hate using debit. I use huh? okay. we use a credit card. Uh, but okay. we pay it off every single month. We're huge yep. Costco people. In fact, I should be sponsored by Costco by the amount of money I spend <laughs> there. But, um, we, we have the Costco city card. And what we do is we, you, we spend that for, or we use that for every transaction that we can. There's only one store that uh, does debit only. And it's only for like bottle, bottled water that we go to. Uh, but other than that, we use a hundred percent of this city credit card and we literally come home and we just pay it like right then. Um, and so what that has allowed us to do is one, crank up our credit numbers, but also right. we get money back for being a Costco executive member and money back from city. So we have our Costco membership paid for every single year, plus about a hundred dollars in our pocket. But then the last three years from the city card in February, we get like $1,300 free back from just using that card every year. And so we just, yeah, we don't, I don't use cash. I don't use debit. I use our, we use our city card for everything. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. A, a couple of stories in, with finance, you brought up Sears and my, yeah. my daughter and my wife were playing a game called like, I don't know, five second. And basically you have five seconds to name three things. And one of them was, I don't know, department stores. And my wife has said Sears and my daughter's like, what's Sears? <laughs> I was like, yeah, they kind of are out of business. But back right? in the day, they were the bomb. They like you went, you went there for everything. Yep. And then in regards to like the Dave Ramsey, we kind of do the same thing uh, that Jason does is that we use a software called YNAB, which puts all the money into digital envelopes kind of. Okay. Like, and yep. then you only use one account. But uh, yeah, that works really well for us yeah we just do a lot of transferring so when i get paid we literally my wife has come up with this thing for the last few years and we use a google doc and we basically say okay every paycheck we take this amount of money and it goes to this account this is our okay. dine out fund this is our grocery fund yeah. this is our you know our family fund fund and when that fund runs out for that paycheck then we don't get to do anything else right we got to wait yeah. till the next paycheck so um we every single paycheck we do a lot of transferring i mean every day we're in our bank account just moving money uh, digitally. Yeah. Right. And so, um, and then we just have this city card account that we just put all the money in. And then when it's due, we just pay it and we're, we call it good. Yeah. It sounds like you're disciplined. I know. I don't think I could do that with a credit card. I think <laughs> yeah. we paid all our debt off. If I got another one, it would be, it would be rough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, I, I think we were really scared about that for a while. Cause we did have two credit cards uh, when we first got married. Or I did. My wife never did, sure. but I had two credit cards. Um, okay. and that we were able, and that was even after the bankruptcy, right. You know, like, cause I, I had them and we didn't close them down and things like that. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so my wife, she's, she's the one that's kind of helped us get back on track for sure. Right. I'm more of the spender. I'm the guy who's the dreamer, like, Oh man, we can go and do this. And she's the person that kind of <laughs> keeps me down and keeps me level headed on things. You yeah. Know? <laughs> do you think that, um, I I've noticed in my marriage, my wife has, typically been in the past the spender mm -hmm. and the dreamer and i was more of the level-headed one gotcha. uh, but in recent years we flip-flopped on that oh, have you noticed much of a shift in that or have you always kind of been the dreamer and she's been the more disciplined one she's definitely the more disciplined one yeah i've always okay. been kind of always and i think it comes from my mom like um, not to really give my mom too much credit cause she's an interesting lady, but, um, <laughs> sure. when, I, when we first <laughs> told fair. her that we were starting top rated in May, my, my, this is my mom's mentality. She says, if you just sell 1 million shirts and you can make $1 off each shirt, you'll be a millionaire. 
<laughs> oh, okay, okay, mom. You know, that's all yeah. it takes. Yeah. <laughs> You know. So, uh, so how I mean, many shirts have you sold? Uh, yeah, not that many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh yeah. man, that's great. Yeah. Um, so a couple of themes that come out on the Threads podcast, yeah. Life Unfiltered, are uh, faith and mental health. And mm-hmm. as we start headed toward wrapping up this conversation, just wanted to give you a platform to um, talk about one or both of those uh, elements and what they mean to you in your life. Man, faith is, uh, to me, is everything. You know, I grew up, like I said, going to church, but I was that kid who would take my G.I. Joes to, to Sunday school and I would sneak awesome. away to class to go to the bathroom and then just never go back to class. I would just play G.I. Joes in the bathroom at church. No one would ever come find me, uh, which was interesting. But, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, so I, I kind of grew up in this and having this uh, knowing of Jesus and, and having a, a strong relationship. And then I walked away when my parents got divorced. I really wasn't we never went to church. Uh, you know, I wasn't involved. My parents never talked to me about church. Um, and I kind of found it through my wife actually. So when mm-hmm. we met at Starbucks, I was this depressed guy who would come home from concerts or working at universal music and, uh, you know, working at Starbucks and I'd go back to my ghetto apartment and I'd have a six pack of beer or I'd smoke a bowl or, um, and, she said at Starbucks, she said, Hey, we've got this young kind of adults. And this was back when in my early twenties. Um, sure. but, uh, we have this kind of college age fun night wondering if you wanted to come hang out. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll go check it out. And I ended up, so this was a church thing. It was a church thing. Yeah. But I was working at Starbucks okay. and she said, Hey, we, we have this fun college age, just rock night, you know, hang out, play games type thing. It wasn't really, um, a preacher type event. Of course, there was a message a little bit, but it was mostly about just kind of connecting. And so um, I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. And so I went and ended up knowing quite a few people that I had grew up with in Eastern Washington. Huh. And this was in the Seattle area. So a lot of just weird, oh, wow. small connections. And um, so a couple months later, you know, my wife and I had kind of just kept running into each other at Starbucks. You know, we weren't really connected. And then it was Easter morning. I was 20 three years old, 24 years old, I think. Um, I, no, I'm not remember one of those two years, but I had was managing a band. We went down to have a night of concerts and I went to my buddy's house. who was the lead singer after the show. And there was about 15 people of us that uh, we'd all just drank so much. We'd all passed out in the basement. And I woke up on Easter morning oh, and man. I looked around and I, I just saw all these people passed out. Nobody was awake except for me. And I literally, in that moment, I felt God say, man, you are done. And in that moment, I quit drinking cigarettes, drugs, cold turkey, gave my life to Christ right there that morning. That's Um, amazing. I called uh, this girl who I'd met at Starbucks, who's now my wife. And I said, hey, I just wanted to say happy Easter to you. And I hope that I get to talk to you again soon. That was it. I got her voicemail. And uh, three months later, we're dating. A year later, we're married. And... um, (laughs) So God just rocked me in that moment, man. And God has opened so many doors for me and, and uh, just been a huge blessing to me and my family and allowed to us to really just kind of share our stories. And uh, it's been such a really cool adventure, man. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then as far as the mental health piece goes, mm-hmm. we like to peer pressure our guests into okay. therapy. I don't nice. know if you've... Uh, no, he did not much. check that box. Okay. It's true. <laughs> I looked in. I'm looking at his boxes. He did not check it. So Ben's going off script. Here, I'm Eric. going a little off script. It's what so I you, do. You do what you want to do with this. I'm out. <laughs> okay. I'm all. I'm all for it. So, uh, you know, Jason and I both see a therapist, uh, different therapists, yep. on a pretty regular basis, and it's been very influential for us. So mm-hmm. we always like to at least mention it with our guests and kind of get their feedback. Um, so in your recovery from uh, drugs and, and the like, and after the traumatic childhood that you experienced, uh, has mental health treatment played much of a role in that process? You know, I did. Um, I have seen a therapist a couple of times uh, in my early years of getting married, uh, and I didn't realize how much crap I was carrying on my shoulders. Um, sure. It opened up a ton of memories, a ton, a ton of pain that I was feeling that I just kind of pushed to the back. Um, you know, my dad was at a, a, a 30 day retreat to get sober for the third time, uh, mm. in my early twenties and, and right after we were married. And okay. I went down to stay at this camp for three days. It was like a family weekend. And I remember being there 
And my dad, I mean, I was just, I was crying. I was like, I don't understand, you know, why my life is the way it is. And this is, and my dad is sitting across from me and there's this room with like five other guys and not a single one of them. Well, not a single one. My dad sat there and didn't say a word while I was just kind of spilling my guts. Right. And then afterwards, my dad wouldn't give me a hug, like wouldn't come up and talk to me. Right. And I remember this guy that was there. I don't remember his name, but I remember him coming up and he's saying, Daryl, this is your son. He's crying. You need your love. And that guy gave me a hug. And it was like the craziest emotional period for me right there. That guy and spoke life into me for, you know, those three days. And I was really, really impactful on my life to see my dad Mm. the way that he is. And my dad, you know, I think we still struggle to connect. Um, but, uh, you know, it, but that moment and, and being with therapists over that weekend and then seeing the therapist later, I think tr- helped me tremendously. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for being willing to go off script. I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's kind of how I roll. So, yeah. um, Eric, we have just, man, what a great interview. I feel like we could just sit down here and talk with you all day. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to chat and tell us about your background and, uh, I'm excited for our listeners to, you know, get exposed to you and um, your podcast, whether they're bearded or not, or MMA right. fans or not. Um, man, you just have a wealth of stories and life experience, and we're just so grateful for you coming on the show today. Well, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. And Jason, I'm loving the beard, by the way. Uh, I wondered if you uh, <laughs> creeped on it. Ben, yeah. ben says we look kind of like. Actually, it, uh, my wife with Sean Whalen, we actually, he's my doppelganger. I can, I'll send you a picture <laughs> totally. of us side by side, and we look a lot of like. It's crazy. It's creepy. As soon as you said that, I like I'm looking at your picture. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's totally Sean Whalen. <laughs> I know, I know, it's crazy. Well, why don't you, why don't you tell our our fans uh, how they can get a hold of you if they want to be on your podcast? Um, you know, the Bearded uh, Biz Podcast or Top Rated MMA. Just yeah. you know, how, and I'm going to share. We'll definitely share all your links and the cool. show notes and everything like that too. So, yeah, thank you so much again. Yeah, TopRatedMMA.com, BeardedBiz.com. Um, Top of May, I talk with all the up and coming fighters that I can globally. I kind of set this goal to talk to a male and female fighter from every state. So I've been keeping a map of, of where those are at. And, and uh, I actually just got awarded yesterday the most listened podcast uh, from fightbookmma.com, which is really cool. That's the first award I've got. And oh, uh, wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really, really pumped about that. I was super excited. They, they threw the award at me. I, I had no idea I was even in the running. Um, so really, really <laughs> wow. cool to, to get that yesterday. Uh, yeah. Number one MMA podcast in the Northwest. We're on top or we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at uh, top rated MMA um, on Facebook. It's actually top rated mixed martial arts is the page bearded biz is bearded dot biz on Instagram or my personal is just Eric G Allen. That's E R I K on Instagram. And then we're on Twitter and, and um, yeah, YouTube. I release shows every week and do fun videos and product reviews. So if you've got products you want to send them to me to have a review, I can do that too. So that's fun. Yeah. Um, I peeked around a little bit of your things and I think you and I could definitely talk MMA. Like I, I super love it. I could talk for hours about nice. fighting and, yeah. and stuff. So um, it, I was kind of excited to talk to you and uh, I'm, I'm gonna, definitely going to follow and start listening for sure. So, well, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Eric. And uh, yeah, have a good day. Appreciate it. It's truly an honor to be on your show, guys. Thank you so much. 